has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. One, two, there we are. Good morning. How are we going? Great to be here with you this morning. Uh, I don't know how much attention you pay to the news. I don't really pay much attention to the news these days. But one thing I did see is that this week we've had a very special coronation, very special royal event. Our very own Mary Elizabeth Donaldson from Tassie, 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 has become the Queen of Denmark. Who would have thought? I wonder if she ever thought, one day I'll be Queen of Denmark. I'm from Tassie. (laughs) Tassie. Anyway, she's from Tassie, just in case she didn't know. So, worked in Tassie, went to Melbourne for a little bit. No one cares about that. She's from Tassie. So, anyway, Queen of Denmark. So, Queen, I think it's Marguerite, Marguerite, abdicated on New Year's Eve 2023, so just last year. And so her son, Frederick, uh, was proclaimed king on January 14, which happens to be my dad's birthday. Happy birthday, dad, last Sunday. And Mary, his wife, was proclaimed queen. Uh, Is anyone here from Denmark, just before I... Nope. All right. So... (laughs) No, no, I'm not picking on him. Um, But I actually think people from Denmark... I've actually met a few people from Denmark, and they're, they're actually really cool. Funnily enough... Uh, I used to have a step family for a period of time, and my stepsister, my middle stepsister, um, started dating a guy from Denmark. She, I don't actually know how she met him, to be honest. Um, doesn't really matter. Uh, but he came and lived with us for a year, and we became really good friends. His name was Jebe Flarup. What a name. Not from Tassie. Uh, he was from Denmark. So he came over and he, uh, him and I became good mates. He was a really chill guy. And you just kind of got this sense that nothing can really bother people uh, from Denmark. But by all reports, this coronation, this proclamation of the new monarch was a huge deal for them. I uh, read things in the paper, or not the paper, online, um, in articles where they were kind of saying, like, even those that weren't monarchists, even those that weren't royalists, they were just like, oh, I just feel so honoured to be here, so blessed to be able to witness Uh, this event. But the event wasn't just a big deal for those in Denmark, the Danish people. Uh, It was a big deal across the whole world. I don't really care too much about this stuff, but it got huge media coverage. There was so much media reporters there uh, because people love seeing a new monarch crowned, a new monarch proclaimed. It's like a big deal and everyone gets around it. Even King Charles' coronation. Now, I don't know what you think of King Charles. We're not going to do a little straw poll right now. Look how happy he looks to be the monarch. (laughs) All that waiting, and he's like, look how old I am, and I'm finally... Anyway, so he, he is, uh, you know, regardless of what you think of King Charles, uh, the fact of the matter is when, when his coronation happened, it was, like, massive. People were watching it in Australia, all around the world, uh, listening to it, tuning in. Uh, it becomes such a big deal. And coronations, really, are times of crowds, cries, cheers, of heaps of religious symbolism, and... They're really kind of special because they're this joint venture of church and state as well towards this positive goal. And today I'm covering a few chapters of John, but mostly John chapter 19. And in John chapter 19, what we see is a very special coronation. This coronation has all of what I've just said and more, except it's twisted. Rather than celebration... The crowds come in condemnation. Rather than cries of joy, we hear and see cries of murder. And rather than cheers of excitement for a new monarch, we see cheers of hatred during his demise. Of course, the coronation I'm talking about is of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The Logos, as John introduces him as in John chapter 1, verse 1. The Logos, the king of the universe. And today I want to read chunks of chapter 18, 19, 20. I know Pastor Josh covered a lot of 18 last week, but in what we read today, and I'd really encourage you to lean in, it is not a fun story to go through. It's not a happy, clappy story to go through, but it is one that we must pay attention to. 
and we must remember. There are three reminders. There are so many things that can stick out in these chapters, so many things I wish I could cover. But today I'm looking at three reminders that we get from this very special coronation and one invitation right at the end. And we will share communion later as well. So it starts in chapter 18. Jesus has been on trial. I'm going to read a fair bit to you today. Apologies. From verse 28 of chapter 18, it says, Jesus' trial before Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, What is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans, though, are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus replied, is this your own question? Or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them, he is not guilty of any crime. But you do have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover, the Jewish festival. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? Verse 40, but they shouted back, no, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary and a criminal. So we start to see this concept of Jesus as king unfold, even at the beginning, even in chapter 18. But just quickly, I want to highlight this person, Barabbas, because we hear about this story, we hear this release of this criminal and Jesus is there and he doesn't get released and uh, we can kind of skip over this. But what's really interesting is that Barabbas's name, literally in Aramaic, means son of the father. Ba, son, Abba or Abbas, father, son of the father. And Barabbas, this son of the father, was guilty. But Jesus the true son of the true father, was innocent. The guilty son here is set free, while the innocent son is condemned. And in this story, this happening of of what happens to Barabbas is an opportunity for us to actually find ourselves in the story because the thing is we are all like Barabbas. Barabbas represents us. We are all sons or kids who have gone astray from Father God. Isaiah 53 puts it this way, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. And I want to break this down a bit. This going astray from God's plan, this leaving and rebelling against God, this rebellion is what Christians refer to as sin. Maybe you've heard Christians talk about sin before and you're like, Man, Christians just love to talk about sin. This is a sin, that's a sin, everything seems to be a sin. But sin is actually much more than just individual things that are wrong. It is the life that we live in rebellion and separation from God. Yes, it is also all the wrong things along the way, but it is the whole package of what our lives entail in and of our own strength. And while we might not be as bad as Barabbas, who is a revolutionary, a criminal, probably a murderer, we have all sinned. The Bible says that all have fallen short of God's perfect standard. And that sin stands like charges against us, a record of our wrongs that testifies that we are guilty, unholy sinners, unfit for the perfection of heaven and unfit for a relationship with a perfect God. No amount of good deeds we do can change the record of those charges. We can do good deed after good deed after good deed. It doesn't get rid of what has already been done. It doesn't get rid of the stain of sin. It doesn't get rid of its record. And because God is just, he must judge and punish sin and evil. I think all of us could probably agree we want 
God, a perfect God, a God who says he is good to punish evil, right? We want evil to be punished. When you see on TV that someone has done something heinous, you go, I wish God would just smite them or do this to them or that to them. But what we don't like to consider is looking in the mirror and seeing that we've actually all done evil. We've all got evil in our lives in some way, shape or form. And if you're honest with yourself and you reflect for a bit, you see the impact or the consequence of evil and sin in your life everywhere. It's in relationship breakdown. It's in those thoughts that you think that you wish you didn't. It's in the way that you treat people sometimes or the way that they treat you. It's the start of every war. It's everything that we see is wrong with humanity. Everything that grieves us about life comes back to sin and evil. But we just don't like to reflect on ourselves and go, that's me as well. Because in our minds, we have this ladder. It's like the good people are at the top of the ladder and all the bad people are at the bottom of the ladder. And we kind of rank ourselves on there somewhere. Like Mother Teresa's maybe up here somewhere and then, I don't know, some really bad person's down here. And we kind of go, look, on that scale, I'm kind of up there. So God's probably generally happy with me, right? But he's really unhappy with those bad people. But the issue with the ladder is that who's the judge of that ladder? You just make yourself the judge of that ladder. Yeah, the good people, God's happy with them. The bad people, he's unhappy with them. But how do we actually know what's going on in people's lives? Every single person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if we have all sinned, then we are all imperfect and therefore unable to have a functional relationship with a perfect God and are unfit for a perfect heaven. The Bible tells us that the wages or the punishment of that sin is death in Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. What does that mean? Well, basically, you think about if you go and do work, you get paid a wage. And the Bible tells us that the wage or the payment for the work done in our lives in and of our own strength, that life of sin, is death. The payment we deserve for the sin we have committed, the sin we have worked on, is death. And it's not talking about just a literal death that we experience, but something far worse. It's talking about a spiritual death, a spiritual separation from God, a spiritual disconnect from our creator, a disconnect from the source of life, a disconnect from the only one who can give perfect and unconditional love, a disconnect from all that is holy and good for eternity, the end point at which we call hell. That is the bad news. That is what we are all destined for. Make no mistake, a Christian who understands their Bible understands that we are all guilty and we have all fallen short of perfection. But in this story, what John does very early on is talks about or shows us this person, Barabbas, the son of the father, being released. And what it does is it signals to us, it signposts to us that Jesus is about to take the sinner's place. He is taking the place of the sinful sons and the sinful daughters. He is taking my place and he is taking your place. And so instead of us having to face God's holy judgment, which we deserved because we are guilty, God's holy judgment instead is about to be taken out on Jesus, who is innocent. He was perfect and yet he has taken our place. Let me finish that verse that I shared before, Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have all left God's plans to follow our own. But the Lord God laid on Jesus the sins of us all. The guilty was acquitted so that the perfect and innocent could be guilty. And so at the cross, the very first thing we're reminded of from very early in Jesus' trial and execution is that Jesus took our place. We must remember that. We must not get... Uh, caught up in, oh, like, I'm better than other people. I'm a better Christian. I'm a better this. I'm more perfect than someone else because at the end of the day, we all deserve the same punishment, yet Jesus took our place. The cross is the great leveler. Chapter 19, then Pilate, and I want you to lean into this part. I want you to try and put yourself in this scene, in the crowd. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, King of the Jews, they mocked. 
as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, look, here is the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. Skip down to verse 12. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leaders shouted, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Caesar was the emperor in Rome. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again, and then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement. It was now about noon on the day of preparation of the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him, crucify him. What, crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the leading priest shouted back. And then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. You know, way back in Old Testament times, there was a prophet called Samuel. And at one point, the Israelite people come to the prophet Samuel and they say, Samuel, we want a king. We need a king. We've looked at all the nations around us and we are the only one without a king. And there was a good reason why they didn't have a king, because God was their king. They were meant to be a theocracy, ruled or overseen by God. And so Samuel warns them, this is a bad idea. A king's going to come along, he's going to take your land, he's going to give you taxes, he's going to do all those negative things that kings do. He's not just always going to be a good leader. He could uh, lead you astray, all kinds of things. But they kept saying, no, we want a king, we want a king. And God eventually says, Samuel, let them have a king. They're rejecting me, not you. They rejected God in favor of an earthly king. And they had a very mixed bag of kings over the next few hundred years. But their second king, King David, was a man that God described as being after his own heart. Because even though David made lots and lots of mistakes, he would keep coming back to God time and time again, repenting and and seeking to change. And so God promised David, it's called the Davidic covenant, he promised David that one day there would be a king that comes in his family line hundreds of years later, and that king would be the true king. He would be the perfect king, the king that the people actually need, a special king, a true, perfect, eternal and righteous king that would rule God's kingdom forever. And this promise was held by the Jewish people really close to their heart. They they waited in hope as centuries went by. And centuries later, the Jews, the Israelite people, were under Roman occupation and almost all hope in this true king ever coming was lost because they were in such a dire situation. But at precisely that time, when their, when their hope was most lost and their need was the greatest, Jesus came into the world to save. The one they'd been waiting for for so long, the Messiah, the everlasting king that was promised for hundreds of years. But instead of being coronated with a gold crown, Jesus is instead coronated with a crown of thorns. And on top of that, then his people say, Caesar is our only king. Caesar was a Roman dictator that the Jews hated. They hated Roman occupation. They hated Roman rule. Everything about Rome disgusted them. And yet here, God has sent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to rule them in a just and right and holy way. And they go, no, we don't want him. Our true king is Caesar. And just like before, hundreds of years earlier, they reject God, the true king, in favor of an earthly king, again. And the thing that sticks out to me in this story as I read it is that we're at risk of doing this too. When we make other things, other people, other concepts, the king of our lives, especially the world, when we go, look, what I do, who I am, my identity, my future, everything, that's going to be dictated by what the world wants. We probably don't think that consciously, but our actions can sometimes show it. And the worst king that we can put in charge of our lives is ourselves. I decide what I do. I don't need God to tell me what to do. Yeah, I'm happy to maybe even go to church on Sunday and float around church circles, but I am the king of my own life. I decide what I do. I decide who I am. I decide, I decide, me, me, me. And we put ourselves as king of our own lives instead of God. 
And Jesus had said in John 5, 23, he said, anyone who does not honor the son is certainly not honoring the father who sent him. And sometimes we're at risk of doing exactly what the Jews did, not once but twice, and pushing away the true, perfect, eternal king who has our absolute best interests at heart in favor of some earthly king, especially ourselves. And so at the cross, as we read, we're reminded that Jesus is the true king and that we're not to fill our lives with false ones, as they did. So they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then the leading priest subjected and said to Pilate, don't put that up there. Change it from the king of the Jews to he said he is the king of the Jews. But Pilate replied, no, what I have written, I have written. See, it was customary for people who were being crucified to have their crimes displayed on a placard. But Jesus' placard didn't say a crime. It didn't say he said I am the king of the Jews as though he was a liar. Rather, Jesus' placard as he went to get crucified testified to his identity. King of the Jews. He was that true Davidic line king that had been promised and now he took his earthly throne. Not a golden one like King Caesar had on earth, but a cursed cross. The cross was his earthly throne. Right now I'm going to encourage you if you could stand and come to the front and to the back if, if you feel you want to share in communion today. Uh, we have some left still down here and also down here and up the back as well. If you can just take your time to grab that and then you can go back to your seats and sit. Chapter 19, verse 28. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. These are really victorious sounding words, aren't they? It is finished. But what we've got to understand is to everyone watching, this did not look like a victory. This looked like 
a brutal defeat. Jesus had just been successfully executed by Rome like a common criminal in the most non-Roman citizen way. So what was the meaning of Jesus' words? What was the victory behind it? Well, earlier I spoke on the fact that we all had this record of charges against us. Our sin stands to condemn us, calling us guilty, sinners, unholy. Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul, a guy who wrote in the early church time, wrote in Colossians 2, 14 to 15, Jesus cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So even though this spectacle looked like the most awful of defeats, Jesus and the church considered it a victory because with each whiplash that ripped Jesus' flesh, a charge against you was being cancelled. With each thorn that shredded Jesus' skull, a charge against you was being cancelled. With each bruise he gained from rods and punches, a charge against you was being cancelled. With each nail that drove into each hand and foot, a charge against you was being cancelled. And as he hung for hours in agony, suffering the full fury of God for sin, something that we can't even, they wouldn't have even been able to see, but the experience he was having, the disconnect from his creator and his very essence that he experienced for the first time in all eternity. He experienced a literal hell on earth as he hung there for hours experiencing that agony, charge after charge after charge after charge against you was being cancelled until there was no record left to point to. So instead of signalling a crushing defeat, Jesus' dead and mutilated body was like a victory flag that announced to all angels, demons, heaven, hell and Hades that nothing could now separate you from returning to your Creator. No sin, no imperfection, nothing. No one that anyone can point to you and condemn you with and say, well, you used to be like this, your past is that, but you've made these bad choices, whatever. No one can condemn those that God calls righteous and they call, He calls us righteous because of the cross because of Jesus' sacrifice. And so at the cross, we're reminded that Jesus was victorious. This morning, you can eat and drink, stay in your seats, and these guys are going to sing for us. So as the song 
tells us Jesus' body was taken down and buried in a tomb in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, one of his followers. And in chapter 20, it says, Early on the Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. And she said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Of course, we know that they hadn't taken him. He had risen. And Jesus soon appears not only to Mary, but to all of his disciples as well. But when he appears to his disciples, there is one disciple that isn't there, a guy called Thomas. So later in verse 20, it says, One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told Thomas, we have seen the Lord, but he replied, I will not believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side and don't be faithless any longer, but believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, Thomas, you believed because you have seen me, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Just as Jesus' cross is empty, his tomb is now empty also. But like Thomas, we actually need to choose to believe it. Maybe you're here this morning and you're still on the fence about the whole Jesus thing. You're like, if I could just see a bit more proof, if I could just have a bit more evidence, if I could just, if I could just, if I could just. But Jesus comes amidst his closest friends and he says, that's not how faith works. You're not going to have all the answers. You're not going to understand everything. He says, blessed are those who believe without seeing, without seeing. And so the reminders of the cross that Jesus took our place, that He is the true King and He is victorious. But the invitation of the empty tomb is as Jesus said, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And He doesn't mean that as an insult. He doesn't mean that in a mean way. You've got to remember He loved Thomas. He's inviting the one who He loved. Don't be faithless any longer. It's your time. It's your time to believe. And so this morning we're going to sing this song about Jesus' death and resurrection, oh praise the name. And as we do, if you've never accepted Jesus into your life before, if you've never chosen to believe what he did on the cross and ask for forgiveness of your sin, if you've never made the decision to become a Christian and to put Jesus as king of your life, where he ought to be, and you would like to do that for the very first time today, then I would encourage you during this next song, just come down to the front. Be brave, be bold. Don't worry about who's around you. Come down to the front and one of our pastoral team will come and pray with you and talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So let's all stand together. If that's you, you can come to the front and we're going to sing.